as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Fatherlessness. Okay, fatherlessness is an epidemic in our culture causing pain and suffering across multiple generations. And, and I personally believe that much of the, the brokenness we see in our, in our lives and in our world can kind of be traced back to a lack of fathers. I don't know if you know this, but it's said that 43% of children in America tonight will go to bed without a father in the home. 43%. And there has been study after study done that shows the negative uh, consequences, the negative effects of having no father in the home. And I'll share with you just a, a few things. 90% of homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 90%. 75% of adolescent uh, patients who are in chemical abuse programs, these, these teens are from fatherless homes, 75%. Fatherless boys and girls are twice as likely to drop out of high school, twice as likely to end up in jail, and four times more likely to need help for emotional or behavioral problems. You may say, like, well, what does this matter? Why are you talking to me about this? You have been impacted deeply by your earthly father. Um, if you didn't have a father or if you had a father who was hurtful, it has deeply impacted you in ways that probably have negatively affected your view of God. Even the word father carries with it weight and sometime, sometimes baggage. And here's the thing, we all have this, this desire in our heart, this longing in our heart to receive the love of a father. We want to receive the father's love. We want to be loved completely. We want to be loved fully. We long for that. And what I want you to understand is that that longing, that heart's desire is good. That's a good thing. However, that desire can't be fulfilled by an earthly father. It's a, it's a God-sized hole that only God can fill. But here's the good news. You have a heavenly father. That's good news. A heavenly father who is unlike your earthly father. A heavenly father who is holy and perfect, just, good, who loves you. As we've been looking at Galatians, what we've seen is these false teachers came in and they started saying all kinds of things that were just damaging and destructive to the church. They were saying to to the Galatian Christians, you know, if you want to be accepted by God, if you want to be brought into the, the covenantal family of God, well, then you need to follow the rules and the regulations, and God won't love you unless you do the right stuff, and if you do the right stuff, well, then he'll love you. These are the types of things they were saying, and Paul has been writing to say, no, 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 that's not the gospel. That's not the truth. In chapter 2, verse 16, he said, you're justified not by works, but rather through faith in Jesus. He went on to say in chapter 3, verse 10, those who try to somehow prove themselves by the law are actually under a curse of the law. We don't perfectly obey the law, so the law curses us and condemns us. And then he says, the righteous will live by faith, meaning not that your faith makes you righteous, but as you believe in Jesus, you're gifted the righteousness of Jesus, and the Father sees you righteous in Christ. You can't enter the family of God by your works. So how do you 
How do you gain acceptance? How do you, come, how do you get into the family of God? Well, the answer is adoption. Adoption. And so, the thing we're looking at today, kind of the big idea is that because God the Father loves you, he sent Jesus to redeem you so that you could receive adoption into his family. Right? The Father loves you. To show his love, he sent the Son to redeem you, and you can receive adoption into his family. And as we study this section of Scripture, there are going to be three things that we're going to look at that will help us understand just the power and the beauty and the freedom of what it means to be in the family of God. And so here's the first thing that I want you to know, and that is, is that God does the work of adoption. This is a work of God in which he does for us. So let's look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul said this, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption. There's our word, adoption, as sons. And that word son just means sons and daughters. So when you see it, always think sons and daughters. Okay, now, what is adoption? Let's define this before we talk about it throughout our time together. Here's a definition. Adoption is an act of God in which God does a great work to allow those whom he's caused to be born again, so born again, that's important, and justified through faith in Jesus, that's important, to become members of his family and co-heirs with Jesus Christ according to the hope of eternal life. Now that, that, that definition is a little bit complicated. I'll simplify it for you. Adoption is when God does a work for you to bring you into his family. There you go. Why do we need adoption? Well, let's look at what Paul said to the Galatians. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 again. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. Now, in verses 1 and 2, what Paul was doing here is he's using this human example to teach them a spiritual truth. He's showing them uh, what life was like before they were liberated by the father through the son. And this, this idea here is one that has some cultural significance. And so understand this. In Paul's day, if a wealthy family had a child, what they would often do is they would put that child under the care of a guardian. And the guardian would oversee the child until the child came of age. And so if you remember, last week Paul talked about how the law was a guardian that was overseeing the Jewish people. And then Jesus liberated them. Now what he's doing is he's using the same example, the same idea to show how the Galatians who were Gentiles, which means they were Greeks, were also under a guardian. In verse 3, he explains who the guardian is. He says, in the same way, we also, when we were children, so he's talking about before before you became a believer, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. And so what Paul's saying, he's saying, Galatians, remember who you were before you met Jesus. Remember what life was like before you met Jesus. You were living in this pagan culture, and there was uh, all this kind of religious syncretism, all these different religions, and people were just kind of meshing it all together, a pluralistic pagan society in which you partake, you partake, you were participating in it, you were living it, you were enslaved to these ideas and this idolatry, and that was your life before Jesus. He uses that phrase, elementary principles of this world, to talk about just all the the demonic bondage and all the, the ideas and the sin and just all of it. He basically, like, there it is, all the idolatry. Now, like the Galatians, we live in a secular culture We live in a time when there is all kinds of religious syncretism where people live for themselves and do what they want. And so what is true of them is true for us as well. Apart from Jesus, we are steeped in sin and idolatry and selfishness. My life before Jesus was selfish, self-centered, sinful, 
doesn't mean I never sinned now. It just simply means I lived in sin and that was my, that was my world. I was enslaved to it. Idolatry, selfishness. And the Bible says that all who live apart from Jesus are living under the the bondage of sin. Your desires are for sin because you're enslaved by sin. And so Paul here is saying, you know, that was your life until the Father did something. Now, what what did God do to, to, to make a change in your life and to bring about adoption? Let's look at verses four and five. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. And so this is the gospel. It's like compact in two little verses here. I would suggest, you know, highlight this in your Bible. If you've got a Bible app, highlight it, right? This is what you want to, you want to memorize this. You want to meditate on this. You want to know this verse. You want to think about this verse all the time. And there's a lot going on here. He says, when the fullness of time had come, he's speaking here about how God the Father had a plan of redemption and adoption, that before God even created the earth, he chose you in Christ to receive adoption. He chose you to be saved in Christ. And when the time was right, according to God's plan, he acted what did he do God the father sent forth his son and so the father sent God the son from heaven to earth on a rescue mission a mission of redemption how did Jesus enter into our world born of a woman Okay, now that phrase is really interesting. Contrary to what Mormons teach, God the Father did not have physical sexual relations with Mary. That's a heresy. It's not, that's not what the scriptures say. It's not true. The Bible says that Mary, who was a virgin, all of a sudden, by this miracle of God the Holy Spirit, conceived the child who was God the Son. And so it was this miracle of conception that took place. Right? That's a surprising day, is it not, ladies? You're going about your day, and all of a sudden... You're with child, and it happens to be God. You're like, I didn't expect that. Nobody did. It was the Father's plan. Nobody expected it. And so God enters into our world by being born of a woman, a natural birth. But what this does is it shows us that as Jesus came into our world, he was born into humanity as a person. He took on flesh. And that's very important because you need to understand that Jesus is fully God and he's fully human. He took on flesh. And because he's human, he understands what life is like as a human. He can identify with you in your struggles and your hardships and all the the challenges of life. Jesus knows what that's like because he's lived as a human on earth. He knows the pain we suffer. But because Jesus is God, he's able to mediate between us and the Father And so the Father sends him to do this this great work on on the Father's behalf for us. And he's born of a woman. But notice he's also born under the law. And that little phrase there, born under the law, is important because it's showing us that Jesus is born to a certain people group. He was born into the nation of Israel in the line of David, according to the prophecies. He was born into a Jewish family. Right, this idea of a blonde hair, blue eyed, white American Jesus, that is unbiblical. That is not Jesus. Jesus was Middle Eastern, he was Jewish, he spoke Aramaic, he was born into a Jewish family, and he lived under the law. Now, the reason that's important is because Jesus, unlike everyone else, he lived a perfect sinless life and he perfectly obeyed the law. And because he perfectly obeyed the law, he fulfilled the law. And because he fulfilled the law, that means that he alone is able to do a work of redemption on our behalf. He's not under the curse of the law. He's free from the law. But he's born of woman. He's under the law in the sense that he's born under this concept of law, but he's not not under the curse of the law. He's free from it. And then look what happens in verse 5. To redeem those who were under the law. That little word redeem is so incredibly important. It means that he paid a price to set free his people. That he paid a price to liberate us. Now, what was the price 
that was paid. Think of this. What price did it cost the father to redeem his people? Well, the son. That's what it, that's what it cost him. The father so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes him should not perish but have eternal life, that the Father was willing to give his only Son in order to accomplish this work of redemption. And Jesus was willing to give himself, to give his very life. That little word redeemed, it connects to chapter 3, verse 13. Do you remember chapter 3, verse 13, which says, uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. This is talking about the cross. I mean that God himself humbled himself to the point of going to the cross to die in our place for our sin. He became a curse to free us from the curse that Jesus died for our sin, taking the righteous wrath we deserved, we ought to have, have, have got. He took that wrath so that we don't get it. He took it upon himself. He gave his life. He shed his blood. The price his blood, the price, his life, the price, Jesus gave everything to redeem us, to free us from sin and to free us from the curse of the law and to, to do a great work of redemption in our lives so that it's possible for us to receive forgiveness from the Father and to be justified before the Father and then be adopted into the family of the Father. Look what he says so that we might receive adoption, right? He redeemed those under the law. Why? So that we might receive adoption. Redemption leads to adoption. It wouldn't be possible for us to have fellowship with the Father or in his family, be a part of it without being redeemed first. And so Jesus redeems us and through his redemption brings us into the family of God. Now I want you to see that all this when you put it together is that God does a work of adoption for you. The scriptures don't say, hey, you need to go and do some, you know, the right stuff, follow the laws, follow the regulations, follow the rules, do all this stuff, and then you can be a part of God's covenantal family. Rather, the scriptures, the scriptures say that he sent the Son to redeem you so that you could be a part of the family. God has done the work of redemption for you. Praise God. Now, why does God do adoption? Like, what's his motivation? What's his heart? Love. Love. This is so incredibly important that you get this. He loves you, and that is what is motivating him. He loves you so much that he wants you to be able to have confirmation in your adoption. Right? How do you know that you're adopted, that you're a child of God? Well, that leads to the second point. God gives confirmation of adoption. Okay, God will give you confirmation. We see this in verses 6 and 7. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Okay, so, so God loves you. And because he loves you, he adopts you. And I need you to understand what this means, okay? The significance of his love and how it's connected to adoption. Maybe you knew someone who was a kid who didn't have a family. Maybe you are a kid who doesn't have a family. And if you've ever known someone in that situation, they can maybe bounce around from, from house to house to house. They just stay at a friend's house for a little while, and then they stay at another friend's house for a little while. And in a situation like that, sometimes what happens uh, is that a person will show up, and they'll say, hey, here's the couch. We're glad you're with us. You can stay with us for a few weeks. But, you know, eventually, you know, you're going to have to find another place because you can't stay here forever. And so we're glad you're here, but here's the couch, and, you know... Wish we could do more. That's not the love of the Father. You see, the Father brings you into his home and he says, yeah, there's the couch and that's where we you know, hang out and have fun together, but come over here. I want to show you. Here's your room. This is your room. And that bed, that's your bed. And this is where you will stay and you're going to be with us forever. You're in our family now. and You're adopted. You're a part of the family. You don't need to worry. You don't need to be afraid. You're part of the family and we're not going to make you leave. You're not going to be kicked out. We're, we're together forever. We're family. That's adoption. 
And God wants us to know this. He wants us to, to have such confidence and assurance of our adoption, so much so that the Father sent the Spirit of His Son, that's talking about the Holy Spirit, into our hearts. When you believe in Jesus, you are born again to living faith. And that language of being born again means you receive a new heart, new desires, a new life, that you are given the privilege of becoming a child of God. You're brought into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And at the moment of conversion, when you become a Christian, God the Holy Spirit indwells your heart and lives within you from that point on. You have the Spirit of God living within you. And the Spirit of God is your guarantee that you're in the family. The Scriptures say that the Spirit is the guarantee of your inheritance. And notice, what does the Spirit of God do? It says here that the Spirit is, is in our hearts and He is crying, Abba, Father. So the Spirit is crying out in your heart, Abba, Father. Now, this word Abba, what does that mean? Okay, he's not, he's not talking about the 1970s Swedish pop band. And if you're too young to know that reference, then your homework is to go on Spotify and to type in Abba and to listen to it. And then you can decide for yourself if that's a good thing or a bad thing, right? But this, this word here, Abba, is Aramaic, and what it means is it means father. It's oftentimes a word that was used by little children for their father, so it's kind of a, a term that really has, carries with it, you know, uh, intimacy and passion. It's, it's like saying daddy. It's a word that, that is really heartfelt. And so we see here the Holy Spirit crying out in our hearts, that's your father. You have a heavenly father. That's what the Spirit's doing. The Spirit's ministering to you, ministering to us by revealing who our father is. And you have to understand the significance of this. Okay? Because in, in the... Um, you know, under Judaism in the Old Testament, there was an awareness that God was a father. A few times in the Old Testament, it talks about God as a father. But when it speaks of God as a father, it usually speaks of God as a father to the children of Israel. So it's like God's the father of the nation. And when Jesus was on the earth, he started teaching people, you know, God is your, your Abba Father. I mean, this word, this word here, Abba, Father, this is what Jesus prayed when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He would call out, Abba, Father, and pray to the Father. And he started to teach his disciples, when you pray, pray to the Father. Pray, Abba, Father. And so Jesus is, is making these connections to God, not as the Father, but your Father. And the Spirit is ministering to your heart so that you know that, that God isn't a father, but is my father. And so the Spirit ministers this truth to you so that you can have assurance that you're adopted and a part of the family of God. Now, as the Spirit ministers this, it brings about this, this kind of reality that we see in verse 7. So you are no longer a slave, but a son or a daughter. And if a, a son or a daughter, then an heir through God. And so you see this, this, this kind of, uh, you know, you, you were a slave, but now you're a child. You see this, this, you know, you're not a slave, but now you're a son. You're a, a daughter. You know, before Jesus, you were a slave. You were enslaved to sin, but not anymore. Now you're a child of God. Or you were enslaved under the bondage of the curse of the law, but not anymore. Now you're a child of God. Or you, were, you were enslaved under the domain of darkness, the influence of Satan and demons, but not anymore. Now you're a child of God. Or you were enslaved under the influence and the demands of this world, but not anymore. Now you're a child of God. You were enslaved to fear and worry and anxiety, but not anymore, because now you're a child of God. You see, a slave has a master, and the master looks upon the slave, and the master says, perform, slave, do what I say, or I will beat you. Follow the rules. Live up to my expectation. 
or suffer the consequences. And what the scriptures and the spirit is teaching us is that God is, is not looking at you as a slave and he's not put himself in the place of a master who's expecting you to perform as a slave, but rather he's your father. He's your father and, and you're his child. And a father loves the child. Not because of what they do, but because of who they are. A father loves the child. And the Spirit cries out in your heart who your father is so that you can know, my father loves me. And what this does is it brings about great freedom in your life. You're no longer in bondage as a slave. Now you're a child. And not only are you a child, but you're an heir this little phrase here, an heir through God, is very interesting. It's talking about being a co-heir with Jesus Christ. This, this promise that God gave to Abraham, that he gave to Christ, we looked at that a few weeks ago. This promise of God, it's fulfilled in Christ. Well, now we partake of this promise as heirs, as co-heirs with Jesus. And what this is talking about is inheritance. You know, you're a part of the family, and you get a part of the inheritance, just like all the other kids, you get, you get equal share in all the good stuff of the Father. And whatever God the Father is giving, God the Son, He's giving you as well. That's what this is talking about. You may say, well, what does that look like? The Bible references this in different ways at different times. Some of the things that this means is, well, you're, you're given an inheritance, salvation, and eternal life. Praise God. You're given an inheritance. The Spirit Himself dwells within you to empower you for life and mission. Praise God. You're given an inheritance. The Bible says that you have received all the spiritual blessings that are in Christ. This is peace. This is rest. This is comfort. This is joy. Praise God. The Bible says that there is this inheritance of a future promise. Even though you physically die, in Christ you will rise physically to receive a glorified, resurrected body to never die again, to, that can't be impacted by sin, to live with God face to face forever. Praise, praise God. And the greatest gift that God gives us is himself. And he brings us into fellowship and relationship with him. And we have a part in this inheritance. And when, that, when, the, when, the, when the scriptures talk about inheritance, sometimes it'll use the language of your inheritance is imperishable, it's unfading, it's being kept in heaven for you. So, so practically, this, there's a reality of adoption in your life right now, you're not a slave, you're a child. And then there's a promise of an inheritance that you will receive, that you will enjoy for all eternity, that's being kept in heaven waiting for you. All of this is because Jesus redeemed you and brought you into the family of God. But understand that this idea of adoption isn't just about God giving us stuff. It goes way far beyond that. It starts to even include, like, how do we do relationship with each other as a community, as the community of Christ, which leads to the third thing we, we see. Through adoption, God created a unified family. Okay, God does this work of adoption. He gives us confirmation of adoption. And then through adoption, he makes us a family. And we're not just a family, we're a unified family. So now we go back to chapter 3 and we look at the verses that we skipped over earlier, verses 27 through 29. He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So he's saying, those of you who are believers, those of you who are Christians, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, now, now notice in verse 28, Paul is creating some categories. There's like three categories that he creates here. The first is neither Jew nor Greek. And so we've got a category of ethnicity and race, this kind of people being defined by their ethnicity. That's one category. He says there is neither slave nor free. That's a second category. It has to do with uh, economics and social standing, social classes, and then we see a third category, no male and female. So now we've got a category over here that has to do with, with gender and uh, sexuality and things like that. And so he's created these three categories. And what he's doing 
is, is showing the Galatian Christians that now that they're in the family of God, things are different than they were prior to meeting Christ. He's saying the, the way that the world does life is not the way we do life as a community of Christ, as the people of God. As Jesus came to earth and established the kingdom of God on earth, now we live in this, this kingdom reality on earth. This is our, 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 our current reality, is this kingdom reality where we are the family of God. And because we're the family of God, the way we do life together is different. No longer are there these kinds of distinctions that Paul was making and showing in the culture of that day. No longer are people separated because of their ethnicity. No longer are people separated due to their social standing. No, people, no longer are people sep separated because of their different genders. And no longer do people look down upon someone else because of their, their ethnicity or their, their, their social standing or their gender. None of that is to happen in the family of God. And so what he's doing here is he's saying, in the, in the, in the family... We're equal. We're all equally children. We're all equally image bearers. We all have dignity, value, and worth. We're all equally loved by the Father. We're one. See? See how he does it? He says, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that, that word one is really interesting. He's, not, he's, he's talking there about unity. This is unity language. You're one. He's not saying you're all the same as though we're the, the same person. Rather, he's saying, no, we're, we're all unified in Christ. I mean, how is it as a Christian, you can go across the globe, you can go to a different country you've never even been to, and if you run into somebody who's a Christian, who's legitimately a Christian, and you get into a conversation with that person, you immediately have a lot in common, and there's a connection there. And you're like, we have like a bond together. It's as though we're like a, a brother or a sister. Well, the reason is, is because you are a brother and sister, right? You're, you're family. And that's the reason there's that connection, there's that unity. And what this means is that we can celebrate uh, the unity that we have in Christ. And what's wonderful is in the family of God, there's diversity. We're different. We're not all the same person. We have individual personalities, different gifting. Uh, we have differences. We're not the same, uh, but we are one. We are unified. One Father, one Son, one Spirit, one faith. Right? We're, we're unified together as the people of God in Christ. So what that means is that when you look upon someone else who's a believer, you have to see them as, you're my family, you're my, my brother, you're my sister. We're in Christ together. Now notice what he does in verse 29. This is interesting. I want you to pay attention to two words, if and then. Pay attention to those words. He says, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring heirs according to the promise. So here's the question. Is every person who's alive on the earth just by sheer fact that they're a human being a child of God? Is everyone a child of God? The answer to that question is, well, no. Which that may be challenging to some of you. But what you see the Bible doing is creating kind of two categories. There's Child of wrath, these are people who have rejected Jesus. They don't love the Father. They want to live for themselves. They've said, I don't want to be in your family. And then there's child of God. These are people who love Jesus and they love the Father and they want to be in the family. And here we see him showing these differences. He says, if you are Christ, if you belong to Jesus, then and only then are you Abraham's offspring. Are you a child of God? And so we bring this all together to, for me to ask you, you know, are you a child of God? Have you, have you believed in Jesus and received this gift of salvation, forgiveness of sin, justification, being made righteous in the sight of God because you've been given the righteousness of Jesus, adoption, being brought into the family of God? And I want you to understand as I ask that question, if you're saying to yourself, I don't think I'm a child of God. God gives us his word to show us who he is so we can know who we are to bring us into relationship and fellowship. 
that we're given the, the gospel, the good news of God, so that we can know him and love him and have fellowship with him. So if you say, I don't think I'm a child of God, there is an invitation for you to receive Jesus by faith, be justified and born again, and be a part of the family of God. This looks like surrendering your life and saying, I'm going to trust in you, Jesus, as Savior. All of this that we see happening through these verses, teaching us about adoption, is to help us understand how significant it is to have relationship with the Father, that your relationship with your heavenly Father is of utmost significance. It is so incredibly important. I mean, think about this. You were a slave, but he's made you a child. And I know sometimes I talk to people and they say, well, it's hard for me to get this, this idea of God as my father. I mean, God is, he's, he's, he's different than me. He's, he's, he's almighty God. He's holy. He's all powerful. Who am I? Who am I that God would even take notice of me, that the Father would notice me? I'm nobody. That's what makes this truth so beautiful, right? Who are we? We're nobody, but the Father loves us. The Father loves you. And by identifying himself as Father, God is showing you how to relate to him. You can, you can respond to him as a child will respond to a loving, kind Father. So how should we respond? I want, us, I want us to go, by way of application, I want us to just focus on verse 6 again. God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Here's the question. What would it look like for you to join with the Holy Spirit in crying, Abba, Father? For you to, to cry out, that's my Father. I mean, when was the last time you really cried out to the Father? I'm talking like everything out on the table, hard out on the table, everything. Like full on. Bleh. Right? This is women with mascara running down the face type of cry out. I know all the guys just got really uncomfortable. <laughs> They're like, you're talking about emotions, man. I don't cry. Uh, Jesus cried out to the Father, and he was the perfect man, more masculine than any of us, and he cried out to the Father. I mean, think about a little child for a moment. You see a little kid, and if they get hurt or something happens to them, it's just so natural for them to just want to cry out, Daddy, help me. Right? They'll cry out to Mommy or Daddy, help me. It's so natural. That's this imagery that we see, a little, a little child crying out to their daddy. What has to happen in the life of a small child in order for them to not cry out, for them to, to say, I can't cry out? I mean, something, something terrible has to happen for them to, to feel like, I can't do that. I say that because I want you to understand if, if, you, if you struggle to cry out, that is just, that's indication that there's something broken, something's not right in your heart. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help you to understand. God has given you the Holy Spirit to empower you and to help you be able to cry out. So in the power of the Spirit, you can cry out to God. And if that's difficult for you, understand that God is inviting you to that kind of fellowship, that kind of intimacy, to where you at any moment, in any situation, can cry out to Him knowing your Father loves you. When I was a, a, a little kid, you know, our, our family had a tradition that we would do. Now, we weren't Christians, and we didn't go to a church service on Sunday. What our Sunday tradition was is that my brother and I, I have a, a younger brother, we would wake up in the morning, and we would run to our parents' room, okay, and I'm a little kid, I'm, you know, six, seven years old, and we would jump in bed with mom and dad, and we would just hang out and laugh and you know, tell jokes and just hang out and kind of snuggle. Very innocent, just hanging out as a family. And my favorite thing to do was I would, I would snuggle up next to my dad and I would, he, I would take his shoulder and I'd try to get him to put his shoulder on my shoulder and kind of press me down into the bed, just kind of squish me. And, and when that would happen, I would feel safe. 
I would feel secure. I would feel like nothing can hurt me. When my parents divorced, that feeling of that safety, security, gone. It was gone. It was just, it wasn't there anymore. And as I've been reflecting on this truth that God is our Father, the way that God has been challenging me is to know that I can go to Him for safety and security, which is very uncomfortable for me. You know, when I became a Christian, I struggled with understanding God as a Father. Now, and I would have said, yeah, yeah, I know the verses, and I can tell you, yeah, God's a Father. I got it up in here, but in my heart, I really struggled to, to understand ex- experientially the love of the Father, to embrace the love of the Father. There was a disconnect between what I knew to be true and what I was experiencing. And that can sometimes happen where we have a disconnect between you know, what, we, what we know and, and what we really truly believe in our heart. As I became a father, God used fatherhood to to teach me and to show me what it means to be a father. He used my own children to show me what it means to love the father, to love him as my father. And I say this because I want you to understand, if you struggle with this truth that God is your father, I understand that. I, I can identify with you in that. Um, and I know that sometimes what can happen is this. The earthly father you had or didn't have can negatively affect the way you see your heavenly father, and it can cause a lot of pain or a disconnect or even a distortion to where you see God the Father in a way that really isn't reflective of who he truly is, and and it's your past has, has clouded your vision. Let me explain how this sometimes happens. If, if someone had a, a father who abandoned them, then they, they may be afraid to be vulnerable and to open up to their heavenly father because they think, well, why should, I, why should I talk to him and why should I call out to him? Why should I cry out to him? He may just leave me. If someone had a father who was physically present but emotionally distant, then, then they can go, you know, I don't... I don't know if God actually cares about me. He seems kind of distant. Yeah, yeah, he loves me, but he doesn't really love me. He just has to say that. No, no, he loves you. Or what can happen is if you had a father who was, um, you know, o- only showed affection when you did what he wanted you to do. Go clean your room. Then you clean your room, and then he's nice to you, but it's only on his terms. That can really distort the way you see your heavenly father. You may think, well, he, he only loves me when I do what he wants, when I perform, when I'm being good, he loves me. And when I'm not, he's upset with me. These are distortions. And so I ask you, just, just by way of reflection, like, what, what was your earthly father like? And how has that relationship impacted your relationship with your heavenly father? That's not a question you can answer immediately. You're going to have to think about that. You're going to have to reflect on that. You're going to have to really spend some time sifting through your heart on that one. I've spent years thinking about that. But know this, your heavenly father is different than your earthly father. Even if you had a wonderful, godly father, your heavenly father is infinitely better. There's really no comparison. And I believe we all have this desire to be loved and accepted by our father. And that desire God has placed in our heart because he fulfills that desire. But it can be challenging to cry out because it's scary, right? I got to be vulnerable I gotta let go of control. I gotta expose my fears and all my junk. I mean, God knows everything that's going on with you. He's just inviting you to be real with Him. As I mentioned, God has used fatherhood to teach me about Himself. And I wanna share um, a personal story of how God has helped me in this journey, okay? Uh, when, we, when we first had kids, our, our, um, when our oldest was about a month old, so brand new newborn, uh, my wife Shelly left 
and she was gone. I don't know, she went to get groceries or something. I don't know what she was doing, but I was on daddy duty. This was my first time on daddy duty by myself. I mean, this is a big deal. And she left, and I'm like, all right, I got this. No, not really. Um, and, and it came time to change the diaper, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you a diaper story, so I apologize in advance, okay? And so it came time to change, change the diaper, so I put wonderful little baby boy on the changing table, and I'd, I'd made the classic mistake. I removed the, the old diaper, but I didn't have a new diaper, Okay, just so you know, don't do that. That's bad. I removed the old diaper, and then I turned around to get a new diaper, and he just started to pee all over the wall, right? That's what happens. And so was, I'm like, oh! Now I'm all flustered. I'm like, what am I doing, you know? Where, where's my new diaper? And I'm trying to get the new diaper, and as I'm trying to put the new diaper down there, all of a sudden, he pooped in my hand, Okay? <laughs> I told you I'm apologizing in advance. And so pee's going all over. I've got poop in my hand. And, and in that moment, I'm like looking at this little, this little boy, and, and this is just what happened. I just, I just what's wrong with you? And, like, and he's just kind of, ha, 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 I'm happy, you know. And, and as soon as that moment happened, immediately, like, God convicted me and convicted my heart. And, um, and, and it was... You know, it's hard to explain this, but it's like God spoke to me and said, why are you yelling at your baby? Like, because uh, I'm a sinner, you know, I don't know, I'm terrible, you know. And then, and then God said this. He said, um, you poop on me every day. Okay, now, uh, this is the kind of conversations we have, okay? N- n- not literally. He was like figuratively. Right, like every day I'm selfish or I sin or I do something that's hurtful to the Father. And, and it was like I was having this awareness, like, you're so right. I, I, I do things that frustrate you all the time. I get that. And then this is what, what the Father said. He said, I love you. I love you more than you love your own son. Do you understand? I love you more. Now, now, when you become a parent, you, you think to yourself, I could never love anyone more than I love this little child. And so you're kind of overtaken by the whole experience, like, I love this little baby so much. In that moment to have God say, I love you more, it was just like it blew my mind as, as he was showing me, I love you. And that's the point of, of the story is that your heavenly father loves you more than you even know. He loves you more than you can imagine. If we, if, we can, if we can get that, that truth, then it brings us to a place of understanding just the freedom of being able to cry out, Father, right? in all situations, Father, help me. Father, I'm just so thankful. Thank you. Whatever is going on in your life, you are invited to call out to your Father. He loves you. And he, he wants to to do life with you. Adoption shows us that our Father loves us and he's redeemed us to bring us into his family. And that's so important. It also shows us that we're not alone, right? You're not alone. You have a Father in heaven who loves you and you have family who love you. And this invitation to join in the Holy Spirit and cry out, my Father, is, I hope, life-giving to you. Will you cry out to the Father? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love and your mercy. Father, we thank you that you sent your Son to redeem us, making it possible for us to be forgiven, making it possible for us to be brought into fellowship with you, making it possible for us to to have just this wonderful gift of adoption. And so we thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus, that you entered into our world and you took on humanity. I'm sure that was frustrating at times. We thank you that you lived among us and you identify with us in our our suffering and our hardship. 
We thank you that you were without sin, that you perfectly obeyed, that you fulfilled the law. We thank you that you went to the cross and died for us. We thank you that you rose from the grave conquering Satan, sin, and death. We thank you, Father, and we thank you, Son, for sending the Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for stirring our hearts up so that we can know, Father, thank you for crying out, Abba, Father, and teaching us. And I ask, would you help us to be a people who know that we're loved by the Father? Help us to be a people who know we are not slaves, we are children Help us to be a people who know and experience this overwhelming just acceptance and love from the Father through the Son. And we pray this all in Jesus' good name. Amen.